Hi there, welcome to the first of our summer shorts. Um, this is how we're going to do um, some sort of services, Bible reflection, Bible reading um, for the Chinese benefits over August. Um, and I'm not sure what we'll do in September, but we'll come to that when we get there. So this is for the first of August, so welcome, thank you for joining. Um, and we're going to spend some time looking at this passage uh, from Matthew uh, chapter 18 verses 1 to 6. At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. So we said um, a couple of weeks ago uh, on a Sunday service uh, that this portion of the gospel is uh, focused on Jesus teaching um, the values of the kingdom of heaven to his disciples. And this passage shows uh, what values are ascribed to status and, and importance within God's kingdom. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus, if you remember, has just told his disciples that he's going to die soon. They still seem to be forgetting the whole and be raised to life part of that sentence, but still, they're thinking that Jesus is dying soon. And they're now you can imagine it, sort of looking sideways at each other, wondering who's going to step into those shoes. And um, the question is literally, uh, so then. Um, the, the language is there to link back. So it's saying, given all these things that have happened in the last few weeks, so this is Peter declaring Jesus the Christ, Jesus saying that he's the foundation he's going to build the temple on, and what he binds will be bound, what loose will be loosed. Um, but then Peter... Sort of massively messing up and um, being called an enemy of God by Jesus because he's tempting Jesus with the things that the Satan tempt him, tempted him with. But then him and James and John all being taken up a mountain to have this special revelation of who Jesus is and his royal robes. So given all of that, the disciples are saying, who is, who is the greatest? They are thinking about God's kingdom as they thought about every other kingdom that's ever been on earth. They are anticipating there being a ruler, and then under the ruler there being some leaders, and then sort of some ordinary people, some sort of servants, maybe even at the bottom rank, some slaves. That was the culture that they'd been born and lived and grown and developed in, and that's what they assumed God's kingdom was like. And, probably fairly typically, they all want to be near the top of that pile. They either want to be the leader, or they want to know who the leader is going to be, so they can make sure that that leader uh, is a friend of theirs, or will become a friend of theirs. They're looking at God's kingdom in the same way that they look at every other kingdom, and they're trying to work out the power dynamics. And so, who's going to be the leader? Is it going to be Peter? Jesus, are you going to declare Peter your successor? He's kind of been the focal point of all that's been going on recently. Is he the guy? And spoilers, the answer is not yes. No, Jesus does not name Peter. Rather, he places a child amongst them. And is that because children are so innocent and so kind, <clears throat> so generous? No, I don't think so. Ask any school teacher. Children are just as capable uh, of, of selfishness and cruelty as any adult. The difference with kids is that they don't have power. They don't have autonomy. My children eat the food that's put in front of them. They go where they're told to go. They have to go to bed when I tell them to go to bed. If they don't listen to me, then they have to suffer the consequences of that. Children have no power. That might be slightly different. There might be slightly more power to children now, but definitely uh, when Jesus is teaching these guys, those children have no power, no voice of their own. They are utterly powerless. And the literal translation here is to humiliate yourself like a child, to throw off all, 
all sense of having ownership over your own destiny, to be humbled to the position that a child has within society. Um, you might remember that in chapter 16, Jesus has taught his disciples to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him. And this is a repeat of that lesson. They must seek nothing for themselves. Indeed, to hold on to power, to grasp for it, is to risk entry even into the kingdom of heaven. And so the whole, nation, the whole notion that the disciples started with, that the, the power dynamics in the kingdom of heaven would be the same as the power dynamics in any other kingdom, is completely wrong. Power wasn't some positive that they should be seeking after. It's not even like a neutral that they could take or leave. Rather, power here and seeking status for oneself is seen as a trap, at best, to be avoided. The greatest, therefore, is the one most capable of letting go of power. So why is Jesus, you know, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Because he is creator God and yet relinquished all of that power to be tortured to death on the cross in order to save others. So that's the model. You know, he who's created, giving up all power and authority to suffer and die. That's the model of the greatness in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is teaching the disciples about the values of the kingdom and that the greatest in the kingdom is the one with um, the least power, who gives up power um, and humbles themselves. And he now goes on to teach them how they should treat those who out of choice or out of circumstances find themselves to be little ones, those without power, those without authority or status. And put simply, Jesus says, that those who are without power are to be welcomed, um, he says, in my name, as, as you would welcome Jesus. So how do you welcome the least, you know, the least significant, the least VIP? Well, you welcome them the same way you would welcome Jesus, the creator and sustainer of all things. The least powerful treated with the same respect, the same attention as you would treat uh, the Messiah coming into your house or into your home, into your church. I don't think many of us can claim uh, to live up to this standard in the way we treat children or vulnerable adults or those on the margin of our society. And Jesus is really explicit in teaching the consequences of failing those who are vulnerable, those who are without power, those who have placed their trust in Jesus. They have something of great value. And if anyone um, damages that trust, through discouragement, through careless criticism, through failing to forgive, through failure to care. Well, Jesus doesn't actually say what would happen to them. He just says that it would be much better for that person to drown, drown quickly in the depths of the sea, which I take to mean that very bad things will happen to someone who discourages, puts a stumbling block in front of these little ones. It's a great challenge there to us as, as individuals and as the church community about how we care for those on the edge of things. Who is the greatest? Who is the greatest, I think we've seen, is the wrong question. The question is rather, who can I serve? How can I serve? Who needs the gifts that I have? The blessings that I've been given? I think if we want you know, if we're, if we're hoping for that, that warm welcome uh, into the streets of glory, into that heavenly city one day, the, the command here isn't to work for our own status. It's not about building up um, our own networks, our own friendships, our own followings, but rather to build up those who have no status, have no uh, earthly uh, sort of glory of their own. And now that could be children, that could be disabled people, it could be asylum seekers. Perhaps for you it will be the neighbour next door who rarely leaves the house anymore. It could be a colleague at work who everyone else gossips about and belittles. How can I serve? Who can I serve? How can you serve? Who can you serve? Let's pray. Lord God, we confess that we have failed. We have failed to treat the little ones with the same respect and 
um, adoration as we would respect uh, you or any other venerable person coming into our homes, into our community, into our worship place. Lord, we're sorry for not living up to this call you have placed on us, your church. Help us to live according to these kingdom values. Help us to know who we can serve and how we can serve. Help us to rid ourselves of the striving for status. But joy, but find joy in following you and seeing others lifted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today and uh, I hope you found this helpful. Feel free to email me or leave a comment if uh, you've got any questions or anything you'd like to challenge. Uh, but otherwise, I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.